So hello everybody, my name is Ratna Omipa. I'm the founding executive director of the Global Diversity Exchange, which deals with issues of migration and integration. And I am just by the way, one of Canada's newest senators to the upper chamber. Uh, and I'm really, really pleased in both these positions, really, really pleased to sit down with Philippe Legrain and chat with him and bring you his ideas and findings. Philippe is a, a noted thinker and analyst. He is pro-globalization and has written a book called Open World, The Truth About Globalization. And this, I think, has led him to his work and his focus on immigration, migration, and refugees. In our circles, in the circles of the Global Diversity Exchange, Philippe is already very well known for his book, Immigrants, Your Country Needs Them. And he has now followed this up with a report, a publication called Refugees Work. And he is with me today to talk about this report, uh, which makes the interesting finding for us that humanitarian efforts reap economic dividends. Welcome, Philippe, and thank you for joining us in our little studio here. My first question is about timing. We are in the middle of the world's worst humanitarian crisis since the Second World War. Next week, global leaders, including President Barack Obama and our own Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, will be at the United Nations to address these crises. So your timing is frankly, brilliant. Refugees work. So share with me whether this brilliance was accidental, serendipitous, or deliberate. Well, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. Um, the, the report which we published uh, earlier this year uh, was co-published by uh, OPEN, the think tank I set up, and the Tent Foundation, uh, whose mission is to help forcibly displaced people. Uh, and clearly, the timing is not accidental, um, uh, given uh, first of all, the fact that, the, as you said, the world is experiencing uh, its biggest refugee crisis since, since the Second World War, uh, and in particular, uh, that there have been uh, large arrivals in Europe where it has become uh, the largest uh, political issue, at least until uh, a Brexit happened. Uh, and uh, both the Tent Foundation and Open, the think tank uh, that I founded, um, look at this uh, in a slightly different way. I, uh, of course, um, we recognize um, uh, that uh, refugees are people who have uh, suffered a lot and who continue to suffer a lot. At the same time, we think they have uh, a lot to contribute. Um, it's one thing to say that. Uh, it's another thing, uh, actually, um, uh, to uh, establish it. So what we did uh, is we looked at um, uh, economic, available economic research uh, from uh, around the world. Uh, we uh, looked at recent evidence uh, and analyzed it and came to uh, a really striking conclusion, uh, which is that uh, investing uh, one euro or one dollar uh, in helping uh, refugees uh, yields uh, nearly two euros or dollars uh, in economic benefits uh, within five years and even greater benefits uh, uh, over time. Um, and I think that that's a really important part of this debate at a time when refugees are seen as a burden uh, or even as a threat uh, to say, uh, actually, no, uh, they have uh, a lot to contribute. Uh, they are an opportunity. In, in this country, of course, in Canada, that is a narrative we like to promote. This is a country much as we have been built, as we say, we are a nation in great part of immigrants. I say we are in a nation in great part of refugees. But this is a, a narrative that is somewhat exceptional, I think, for Canada and needs to be talked about in the rest of the world. But evidence always matters. So I thank you for giving us new evidence to go um, uh, to the market with. So let's talk about this evidence a little. You talk about the seven dividends. Uh, and of course, when you use the word seven dividends, it's, it's almost uh, natural to think about the seven deadly sins. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that certainly wasn't the intention. That's not your intention, but as I read it, I said, in interesting choice of the word seven. So let's take it away from sins to dividends. What are these seven dividends? Right, okay. Well, this, it's certainly, um, uh, that is like to do with uh, deadly sins. It's um, the opposite it's, of the deadly uh, sins, uh, yes. In, in, indeed. Um, uh, basically, uh, the thesis of the report or the analytical framework of the report 
is that um, welcoming refugees uh, requires uh, an initial investment, uh, typically of public funds. Obviously in Canada you also have privately uh, sponsored refugees. A and that initial investment tends to be spent uh, on uh, local goods and services uh, and therefore acts like a fiscal stimulus. And that provides the first dividend, which is a demand dividend. Um, and that's very significant, certainly in Europe now, where economies are depressed and, and, and you needed a demand dividend. Then, once refugees start working, uh, they provide a number of further dividends, uh, what we call uh, a 4D dividend for doing um, uh, difficult, uh, relatively dangerous, uh, dull uh, jobs, um, not least um, uh, caring for the elderly, uh, which is the area of fastest employment growth uh, in advanced economies and something which um, uh, young people typically, typically uh, don't want to do. Uh, the second is a def deafness, uh, well the third actually is a deafness dividend, which is to do uh, highly skilled uh, jobs. Uh, and you can see for example that one third uh, of uh, the recently arrived refugees uh, in Sweden uh, have a, a university or college degree uh, and two thirds of those have uh, skills that ma match uh, graduate uh, job vacancies. So they can do vital jobs uh, like being doctors uh, or nurses uh, and indeed by working together with Swedes uh, they can enhance each other's uh, productivity and hence um, uh, their wages. A third area uh, is uh, a, a dynamism dividend. Migrants in general uh, and refugees in particular uh, tend to be uh, more entrepreneurial um, uh, than most. In Britain for example um, uh, migrants are twice as likely to start a business uh, as someone uh, who is uh, born uh, in Britain. And in Australia, uh, refugees are the most entrepreneurial migrants. And you know, really, really famous names uh, are refugee entrepreneurs. People like you know, uh, Sergey so Brin, Brin yes. who co-founded co uh, Google, or Li Kaxing, who's the richest man uh, in uh, Asia, uh, or uh, George Soros, uh, and, and, and. There's a whole list of, of uh, you know. Einstein uh, is a refugee. Sure. I like to remind people of that, yes. And um, uh, so enterprise again, uh, and it's, it's not just you know, starting a, a billion dollar companies. In, in general, uh, if you arrive uh, in a country with a few contacts and without a conventional career, uh, starting a business that creates wealth and employs locals is a natural way um, uh, to get ahead. Then you have uh, a diversity dividend, which is um, uh, that people who've been uprooted from uh, one culture uh, and then exposed to another uh, tend to um, uh, see things differently. They have different perspectives on things and that tends to make them more creative as individuals. Uh, and then you have the fact that diverse groups with people um, with diverse perspectives and experiences tend to uh, be better at solving problems than a group of like-minded experts. Now this isn't just true about refugees or indeed about migrants, it's, it's true more generally, i.e. you know, you add um, a woman to an all-male yeah. corporate board and you see a, a large uh, increase uh, in performance, uh, but certainly in terms of uh, refugees and migrants, um, uh, they uh, groups that, that, that involve their diverse perspectives tend to be more creative, they, they tend to uh, produce more patents um, uh, and, and, and so on, and there's evidence from that um, around the world. Uh, then you have uh, a demographic dividend. Uh, refugees uh, on average um, are young, they're in their early 20s, uh, and certainly in the case um, of say Germany, uh, Germany the average age is 46, uh, it's an aging, rapidly aging population shrinking um, working age population uh, and therefore uh, these young refugees provide an important demographic dividend. Um, first because as young uh, dynamic workers they complement uh, older more experienced Germans uh, in the labour market. Second of all because they help pay for the growing numbers of German pensioners uh, and thirdly because by staving off uh, population uh, decline uh, they support investment and growth and stave off these fears of secular stagnation which certainly exist uh, prominently in Europe. Then you have uh, a debt dividend uh, which is OECD studies show that uh, migrants in general tend to be net contributors to public finances. They tend to pay more in taxes than they take out in benefits uh, and services. And you look at for, for example in Australia uh, you find that refugees become net contributors uh, within uh, 12 years. Now that sounds like a long time, but if you think about it, if you're born uh, say in Canada, 
uh, the first 12 years of your life, you're a net burden on the state. You were receiving free public uh, education, uh, free uh, potentially child care and, and child support. You only start becoming a net contributor you know, beyond the age of 18 or perhaps later than that. So the fact that refugees become net contributors by, within 12 years actually uh, is, is uh, you know, a, a powerfully good thing. And in many countries, notably in Europe, with very high levels of public debt, having increased number of taxpayers spreads the burden of that debt over a, a larger tax base. And last, but crucially not least, is uh, the development dividend, uh, which is mm. uh, that uh, uh, by moving uh, to, um, uh, to seek refuge uh, in a uh, safe and peaceful country, um, refugees obviously increase their uh, life chances, their children uh, even more so, and they contribute to the development uh, of the country uh, that they've left. Now obviously it's hard um, very often to have uh, data on uh, the money that is sent back to conflict-ridden co countries, uh, but it's striking that in the case of say uh, Liberia, uh, remittances, money sent home uh, by refugees, amounts to 18.5 percent uh, of the economy. So a really, really uh, significant uh, amount. So in all these ways uh, refugees uh, contribute uh, to the economy. I, I don't know whether you realize this, but as I listen to you, I'm struck by, of course, the vibrancy of your findings and the fact that you've got evidence behind all of this, but you've also given us new language, and I thank you for that. You know, the idea of positioning uh, ideas not as, uh, you know, uh, simply as, as, as in unimaginative language, but speaking about them as dividends is very powerful. I want to get back to the <coughs> time issue here. It takes time. I, I was a refugee, so I know it takes time. Uh, I know that it cost my family and me and my partner the seven best years of our working life to simply get up to speed, and we weren't contributing at the level we could have been based on various factors. But time is important. Twelve years is in the mind of the taxpayer a long time. Twelve years is sometimes much too long for a political champion who needs to get reelected, usually within four or five years. So is there a conflict between uh, the, the evidence and the, and the policy that arises from the evidence and the political reality? And how do you bridge that? Well, you're right, of course, that it takes time for um, refugees uh, to get back on their feet. Um, you know, my mother was born in a refugee camp. My grandparents um, started off as refugees, and you know, they were qualified people, and they started off doing very low-skilled jobs, and it took a long time to, to build up to uh, doing a highly skilled work again. But the key finding of this report is that, um, or one of the key findings, is that refugees don't start contributing um, uh, start con contributing immediately because the spending on them uh, acts like a fiscal stimulus, which is just at a time like this when the whole world is suffering from division demand, you get an immediate contribution um, from uh, this spending which goes on, on local goods and services, uh, and that is uh, absolutely crucial. Now, you know, at a time uh, when uh, in, in Europe and elsewhere we're looking for areas for ways to boost growth, at a time when you have a new Canadian government which has said, you know, we're not doing austerity, we're doing uh, fiscal stimulus, then actually uh, spending on refugees uh, is part uh, of uh, that fiscal stimulus. It, it, it's an investment. Uh, and if you think about it, you can compare it to, uh, to investing in physical infrastructure. Uh, you invest uh, in uh, building a bridge and that boosts the economy in two ways. First of all, there's the initial spending that goes uh, on building the bridge, which employs people to build it, which um, means that you have to supply building materials. And then you have the future benefits when the bridge is in operation and there's more economic activity going across that bridge. Well, in the same way, you're investing in human capital uh, by welcoming uh, refugees. The initial investment in them uh, is boosting the economy. And then uh, once uh, they start working, that in turn yields uh, further uh, benefits. Now, you are right, of course, um, uh, that uh, um, we can um, produce all, th all sorts of reports like that, uh, and if there is a political climate that is hostile to refugees, uh, that um, uh, you still have a lot of uh, convincing to do. Uh, and it's certainly true that you have someone like uh, Donald Trump, uh, who is talking about refugees um, uh, in the most outrageous way, uh, and um, people persuaded uh, that somehow um, uh, they are a, a, a threat, 
uh, then you need to obviously combine fact-based messages um, uh, with uh, emotional reassurance uh, and uh, appeals um, to uh, other arguments, notably empathy. Uh, so what then are the policy implications uh, of the seven dividends uh, for, let's say, national governments, state governments, and local governments? You can even actually think about multinational arrangements that we have with the UN. What are some of the policy outcomes that you would like to see? Well, there is a striking divergence in uh, refugee outcomes. Um, say between uh, North America uh, and many countries uh, in Europe. So for example, in Europe, um, uh, Somali refugees tend to be uh, unemployed, whereas in the United States, Somali uh, refugees are mostly employed. Uh, now in Europe, the fact they're unemployed is blamed you know, on their perceived cultural characteristics, uh, and as a result, there is discrimination and stigma against them. Uh, and yet that clearly cannot be the case because similar refugees in, from Somalia do uh, much, much better in the US, which tells you actually that what refugee outcomes depends not just uh, on uh, the attributes of the refugees themselves, but also on the policies and institutions in the place um, uh, to which they move. Uh, and I think um, the reason why refugees do so well in the United States and also indeed in Canada um, is not um, um, because uh, the system is particularly uh, generous to them. Uh, it, it isn't. I mean, no, in fact, you're, if you're a resettled refugee, you even have to pay for the cost uh, of uh, your flight, in repay fact, the cost yes. of your flight. Um, so it's not that it's particularly generous. Uh, it's that there is um, uh, an emphasis on, on getting into work uh, and the ability to do so. Uh, and uh, we highlight uh, three things. First, uh, you need uh, the right to work. Um, second of all, you need appropriate skills. Uh, and third, um, uh, you need um, available jobs. Now, in terms of uh, the right to work, in, in advanced economies, they're not in developing countries, refugees do have the right to work. Asylum seekers, though, um, often don't. Uh, and this is perverse, um, that you have um, uh, people who arrive whose asylum claims often take a long time uh, to assess. And during that period, they're not allowed to work as a result of which uh, they are stigmatized, as a result of which uh, they are not beginning the process of, of integrating into society. Uh, and it is absolutely perverse that so many countries um, uh, prevent asylum seekers from working. So one of the key recommendations is that asylum seekers should be uh, allowed to work and that we need to speed up uh, the processing uh, of, um, of asylum claims. Uh, second uh, is in terms of uh, skills. Um, it's very important to assess refugees' education and skills levels um, as soon as possible. If they're being resettled, actually, the assessment can happen before even uh, they arrive, so that you can provide uh, appropriate training um, uh, once they arrive, be it um, uh, in terms of uh, skills, be it in terms of uh, language, um, uh, and, and so on. A second issue uh, is in terms of the uh, recognition uh, and, if necessary, conversion of foreign qualifications. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's even more basic yeah. than that. You know, for example, you fled Syria in a hurry. Mm -hmm. uh, you might not have uh, the documents to prove uh, that you have the medical degree that you say yes. you have. And so you need to have some way for um, people in the host country, uh, you know, say a board of doctors, to assess whether you do actually do have the skills you have and if necessary uh, to provide um, uh, the course to enable you to, to acquire uh, an, uh, an equivalent degree. And the benefits of that are, are huge. For example, uh, in Britain, um, converting a foreign uh, medical degree uh, to enable a refugee doctor to practice in Britain costs on average £25,000, uh, which is only a tenth of the cost of training a British doctor from scratch. Uh, and uh, no doubt the figures will be similar uh, in Canada uh, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, and so that's uh, an, another um, a, a crucial factor. And then, um, and then last, last but not least, you have um, the need for available jobs. Now, one of the perverse things is that refugees are often resettled in places where housing is uh, uh, cheap or available uh, rather than in areas where uh, jobs are available. So if you place refugees in the middle of nowhere, um, uh, then they're obviously much less likely to be able to get back on their feet than if you place them in areas uh, where there is jobs. Another issue is, is discrimination, um, which um, uh, remains uh, in, in, uh, a big barrier and needs to be tackled. Uh, and then you have, um, in some European countries, the fact that there are barriers that prevent outsiders 
uh, young people, migrants, refugees uh, from getting entry level jobs. Uh, and that is uh, clearly um, a, a big issue. So as we're talking about jobs, it's only natural that I ask you the question about the private sector. What is the role of the private sector in all of this? And in Canada, and I'll just speak about Canada, the private sector has stepped up to the plate in different ways. They have donated money to the UN. They have launched private sponsorships of their own. Uh, it is far more difficult for them to come with jobs. We are encouraging this locally. But I wonder about this, this gap in empathy and compassion, which people want to fill, uh, but they will want to do it uh, from, a, from an emotional and charitable impact, whereas what really makes a difference is giving someone a chance at work. What, what is the role? Have you seen something in your research that gives you an idea of a best practice? I think you're absolutely right to say that businesses have a crucial uh, uh, role to play. Uh, after the tragic images uh, of the drowned toddler on a Turkish beach, um, Aylan Kurdi, there was an, a big response not just from um, uh, ordinary citizens but also from businesses uh, in terms and, uh, of, of how we can help. Uh, and while you know, it's great that businesses are, um, uh, as part of their corporate social responsibility, are trying to help refugees, it's also uh, important uh, that they look at hiring refugees as a good investment yes. that's good for the bottom line. So for example, um, uh, Hamdi Lukaya, um, who uh, is the founder of uh, Chobani yogurt, which has mm -hmm. grown to yeah. be the, uh, the best-selling Greek yogurt uh, in uh, the United States, uh, and um, who has founded the, the Tent Foundation to give away his fortune to help forcibly displaced people. Well, you know, Chobani, three in 10 of their employees um, are uh, refugees. Uh, and uh, he isn't just uh, employing refugees in order to do good, he's also employing refugees because it's good for the bottom line, because they are hardworking and motivated uh, employees. Now, yes, there some initial investments were required, so he, he bought a minibus in order to be able to transport uh, refugees from a reception center to um, uh, the yogurt factory. He hired interpreters uh, in, order to, in order to help as well. Uh, but this investment uh, in the refugees has been more than repaid in terms of having loyal, dedicated, hardworking yes. staff, and may I emphasize, who are paid you know, uh, well uh, and treated well, so it's not at all um, an exploitative relationship. And I think that that example um, uh, that's saying you know, it's not just about doing good, uh, it also makes good business sense, I think uh, is something that ought to be followed uh, more widely. Uh, just for our listeners, I want to note that the Global Diversity Exchange and its project Higher Immigrants is, is going to document uh, a series of really good ideas from the private sector in terms of their engagement with hiring refugees. No one employer does it perfectly, but when you put all these stories together, a narrative begins to appear. And we're hoping that there will be great uptake on this. We have great ideas from Siemens in Germany, some from employers in Canada, and putting, putting them together with some of these examples will give more legs uh, to your work. So I wanted to ask you about, you know, Canada has this, this, this narrative that you know, we've stepped up to the plate, we've taken 25,000 plus Syrian refugees, I'm very proud of that, I have sponsored a family, but it's a drop in the bucket. We all know that, it's a drop in the bucket. What do you think needs to happen at the multinational level? We are having this UN summit, do you have any hopes, any expectations? You're absolutely right to say that um, you know, while the uh, Canadian um, uh, scheme uh, is um, uh, generous and uh, you know, well-meaning, that in, uh, with 65 million forcibly displaced people worldwide, with 22 odd million refugees and asylum seekers, uh, that clearly uh, it's only uh, a small contribution uh, and that, you know, the fact is six in seven refugees worldwide are in developing countries, uh, typically uh, in countries neighboring uh, the country where the refugees came from, and therefore the richest countries on earth uh, aren't doing uh, enough. Uh, and especially um, given the message of this report, not only they're not doing enough, uh, but they're also uh, shooting themselves in the foot because if they were more generous, actually uh, that investment in refugees um, uh, would be repaid. I think at, at a global level, you know, we have um, a, a global compact, I'm oh, sorry, the, um, 
uh, the, the global convention uh, and um, a protocol uh, on the status of refugees, uh, which governments sort of mainly honour in the breach. Uh, what we don't have uh, is um, uh, some kind of a, a global scheme for saying, okay, how are we going to share out uh, these refugees uh, worldwide? Uh, how uh, can each country um, uh, welcome more, uh, do more? And if we combine that um, uh, with the message of the report that actually um, it will be uh, good for your economy, uh, then uh, hopefully we can have um, uh, some sort of agreement that uh, delivers better outcomes for refugees uh, 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 and indeed uh, better outcomes for the welcoming economies. Well, certainly from my point of view, from your lips to God's ears, I would certainly hope for that. Uh, you've been in Canada for, what, two, three days now for, for your work. Is there something here that strikes you about how we are, are, are attempting to be generous, compassionate? Is there something that strikes you about us that you would like to take back to the UK and say, look, that's something the British government should consider? I think that there is uh, a government which has a very positive message, and not just the federal government, indeed, at the, at the provincial level as well, I was just in Quebec, um, has a very positive message uh, about the benefits uh, of uh, diversity, um, uh, which I think is something which uh, you know, Europe uh, ought, to, ought to emulate. Certainly in my own country, having just been through a very nasty Brexit referendum, uh, where migrants in general and refugees in particular um, uh, were demonized, uh, that it was so refreshing uh, to hear politicians speaking uh, in such a positive way, uh, and uh, not just words, but also uh, matching those words uh, with action. So I think that yes, at the moment, uh, Canada uh, is a beacon to the rest of the world, uh, and certainly uh, European countries uh, ought to be looking on diversity and helping refugees in a similarly positive way. And conversely, what should Canada be aware of as it continues to ride this wave of a certain kind of exceptionalism? Um, I think that uh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, I, um, We're not immune. I mean, we are a large ocean away. We are, we share uh, the world's longest, safest border with the richest country in the world. Well, but you never know. If you get a President Trump, he might tell you to build right, a, okay. he, he might force you to pay for a wall. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I think, and so, yeah. And suddenly your region, yeah. which is a region of uh, exceptional um, uh, stability, could suddenly seem um, uh, much more threatening. Now, I, th I think you're right to say that clearly um, the situation in Canada is slightly different to the situation in Europe in the sense that you are kind of uh, you, you, you do feel kind of isolated from it and to a certain extent you are picking and choosing the refugees who can come here uh, whereas in uh, Europe uh, to a large extent it's been uh, asylum seekers uh, arriving um, uh, without permission uh, which they're entitled to do legally but which uh, has provoked a political reaction. Um, at the same time uh, I think that um, uh, I would encourage Canadians to build on the successes that you have now um, uh, to uh, continue to open up and embrace the world and to continue to reap the benefits uh, of uh, diversity. What's next for you, Philip? Well, we are doing some, uh, a whole program of follow-up research uh, for OPEN uh, and uh, the Tent Foundation, uh, developing some of the themes uh, in uh, this report uh, and hopefully coming up with more helpful uh, recommendations for policymakers uh, and more persuasive messages uh, to try and uh, change public opinion uh, in this area. Well, I think you're doing really important work. I know your speaking card is going to be very full, partly because we will be beaming this out everywhere. Uh, how do people get a copy of your report? It's the Tent Foundation? You can either download it from tent.org or opennetwork.net. And you can uh, follow Open on uh, Twitter at Open to Progress. Open number two progress. Okay, we will put this all on on our website so our listeners and readers can continue to listen to this podcast and to follow uh, Philippe Legrain as he continues his research. Let me, on all your behalf, 
Thank you very much again. It was mo I could have continued to talk with you for a very long time, but I've been told scientifically, evidence, that people's attention on the web for certain things is only so long, and I'm going to respect evidence, and I'm going to listen to it. And for you, I wish that you gather more evidence and continue to share it with us and others. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure.